Yes, let's go outside. Before you were interrupted, you wanted to show us clause 11. Oh, well, my lord, I was going to address the question you asked. Um, yes. You asked immediately before the break, um, which was, what did the upper tribunal say was the test for determining whether an amount could be taken into account for the purposes of, community, uh, for the purposes of determining, the, determining the amount of profit? Now, my lords, the, 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 I, I've taken you to paragraph 76, mm. uh, and I've said that the, the upper tribunal started by looking at Hostrasser, uh, and, and I know, my lords, you, you're not with me on Hostrasser, and I'm going to look at that later. Um, but after uh, Hostrasser, the tribunal then looked at e Eagles and Levy, and they said, well, in, in the case of Eagles and Levy, Finley J was prepared to take into account the legal costs in that case in, uh, for the purposes of determining what the profit from the, uh, uh, in determining what the profit was. So the upper tribunal said, well, uh, if Finley J was prepared to take into account those costs, um, those costs, the costs in that case were no different from the costs in our case. Um, they were both incurred by the individual in order to get paid. So the upper, upper tribunal reasoned, well, on that basis, uh, the upper tribunal considers that the costs in this case are sufficiently connected um, with the payment so that they can be taken into account. The difference in, in Eagles and Levy was that in that case, the judge went on to say, well, the, the settlement agreement meticulously excluded the costs. So it was on that, on that grounds that Finley J said, well, I'm not going to take it into account because of this. That doesn't apply in our case uh, because the settlement agreement clearly covered the, the success fee because yeah. we've looked at mm -hmm. paragraph three, which refers to the success fee and how it's paid. So I, 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 the upper tribunal didn't lay down any general rule um, about which applies to determine whether it's taken into account. Well, the way you just formulated it, as I, as I wrote down, and perhaps I got this wrong, the costs may be deducted if they are sufficiently connected with the payment. No, no. What the upper tribunal said is in, in paragraph 76 is it said, what, what's the degree of connection that you need? And then they looked at Eagles and Levy, and in Eagles and Levy, Finlay J accepted that the, uh, uh, that the costs in, in, in that case were necessarily incurred in order to get the payment. Right, so costs may be deducted if they are necessarily incurred in order to receive the payment. That was the contention in Eagles and Levy, which Finlay Is that said. the test that you say the upper tribunal adopted? Y yes, well, uh, 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 what I'm saying the upper tri tribunal did is said this, was, this, connect, this amount of connection was considered sufficient in, in Eagles and Levy. The facts of Eagles and Levy are, are, are similar to the facts of the present case. So in the present case, the amount is, is sufficiently connected to be taken into account. Well, uh, that, that's what I'm saying the upper tribunal did in, in, in paragraph 76. Um, what is the test that you propose in order to decide whether there is a sufficient degree of connection? Um, the, the, te the test would depend on the facts of any given case. I, in this case, if you're, incurring, uh, if you're incurring costs for the purposes of being paid, uh, and then you receive a settlement agreement, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, if, if, if you're incurring legal costs for the purposes of suing your employer for, for payment, and then you receive a settlement, to, and then you receive a settlement of that claim. Then, in my view, it's clear that there's a sufficient connection there between the between the costs and the settlement payment. Well, I mean, it's difficult. I find it difficult to see that a legal test for the deductibility of something will vary from case to case. That there must be a principle. That somebody, be it the employer, the tax inspector, the taxpayer, the tribunal, applies in order to decide whether a particular item of expenditure can be netted off against a particular receipt. And I'm just trying to fumble my way towards what that test might be. Well, my lord, we, what we have is we have the word profit in, 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 in section 62. Uh, it, it's, my submission is that it's it, 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 the natural meaning of profit is that it's a net amount. It doesn't say payment, it says profit. Right. And then in any given case, the, the, the question for the tribunal is to ask, what is the profit on the facts of that case? That's, that's what I understand. So, I mean, are you saying that it's what remains at, at 
on the bottom line after you've drawn up a profit and loss account. Is that what you're saying? Is I'm saying in, in, in any, it's difficult to to generalise. In this in this case, I'm saying quite clearly where you get a settlement payment of four million, but you have to spend two million pounds on your legal costs. Then the profit that you make is is the difference. It's quite clear in this case. I take your point that there may be or the HMRC is not, 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 not referred to any, but there may be other cases where it's not quite so clear. Um, but on the facts of this case, my lords, our, our submission is that it, it, it's, it's clear that that amount should be taken into account. Well, I can, I can understand the submission that the test for deciding what you net off is whether the money has been necessarily expended in order to receive the, the sum that you receive. Um... I can understand that as a potential test, and then you, it's a test of necessity, and you have to see whether in each particular case that test is met, if that is the submission you're making. But it doesn't seem to me it is the submission you're making. Uh, that is the submission I'm making, because, right. because in, 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 in Eagles and Levy, um, in Eagles and Levy, the legal costs of, of, of suing the employer for remuneration um, in that case, Finlay J held that they were necessarily incurred for uh, necessarily incurred, uh, and he held that that was a sufficient connection for it to be taken into account. Yes, but he did that in the context of deciding whether it was deductible on the debit side of the of the sheet, not whether it was um, susceptible to taxation in the first place, and that's the problem. With, with respect, my lady, that that's not what. what uh, what Finley and Joe did in, in in that case, there were two two distinct issues in in as in all these cases, there were two distinct issues. The well, first I'm question is whether I'm just looking at the holding held that the costs were not necessarily incurred in the performance of the duty, so as to be deductible from his emoluments. So you've got to have an emolument in the first place in order to have a deduction from it under Schedule Nine, under Rule Nine rather of Schedule E. My lady, can, can I ask you to, to look at uh, page 10, and it's the, um, the, the second full paragraph. I could ask you to read that paragraph, beginning with taking and, and, and ending in yeah. one. Sorry, what are we at? Page 10? But page, uh, uh, sorry, page 89 of the bundle, page, page 10 of the decision. Yeah. Oh, oh, I think there's a, a, a double numbering there, page 89 of the bundle. Second paragraph, taking the point which logically comes second. Is that yes. Yes, yeah. Not a sum that can be deductible as being a sum which the respondent was necessarily obliged to incur. So that's the deduction part. So he, so, so he, he's, he's, he's saying that it's not deductible, mm. but then he still goes on to say, well, mm. is it an emolument? Because if, if my lady, if you turn to the, if you turn to, on page eighty six, this is where the contentions are set out. It's paragraph twelve. So there it says it was contending on behalf of the respondent. The first one isn't relevant. The second one is the deduction question. Yeah. Um, tax on the schedule was charged on the perquisites or profits of the respondent's office un, uh, un, under the company, and that the said costs and expenses were properly were proper deductions to be made in determining the amount of the perquisites or profits assessable. And then there's three, which is the contention that the respondent was necessarily obliged to incur and defray the said costs in order to obtain the payment of remuneration to him. And then four is the point about whether it's in the, whether it's in a monument or not. And in the paragraph I've asked you, I asked you to read at eighty nine, beginning with taking. That's where he's dealing with the deduction point, which he says comes second. Logically, mm. it does come second, mm. because as you say, my lady, you've got to work out whether it's an emolument first. He takes them out of order. He takes the deduction question and says, it's not deductible. He refers to Ricketts. And the reason why it's not deductible, and, and we accept it's not deductible on the facts of that case, is because it's not incurred in the performance of the duty. So under what's now 336 and 337, there's no question that that sum would be deductible. So where is the finding that it's not an emolument? But, uh, no, my lady, he, he he finds it wasn't what an emolument because right. it, because uh, because the terms of the settlement agreement uh, meticulously uh, avoided uh, any reference to costs. 
But what, what, the, what the upper tribunal says is that he was prepared to accept that it wasn't an emolument if the settlement agreement had referred to agreed costs. But, but, but this is an odd thing, isn't it, about paragraph 76? Because the upper tribunal is considering how you determine what profit is. And it says, well, that's difficult. And then it refers to what Mr Justice Findlay said about necessarily obliged. But Mr Justice Findlay wasn't considering what profit meant at that stage. He was considering whether it was deductible. Mm. So Mr Justice Findlay hasn't given any guidance along the necessarily obliged line uh, in terms of calculating what profit is. My understanding of what the upper tribunal is doing is, is it's, it's asking what was the connection in, 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 in uh, Eagles and Levy. And it was, and, and it was saying that... Uh, I mean, when it quotes, in inverted commas, necessarily obliged, it's quoting from a bit dealing with deductibility, which has nothing to do with how you calculate profit. Right. Well, if, if we go to page 80, if we go to 88, he says... Two contentions were raised on behalf of Sir Albert's, the third and the fourth contentions. Now, if we go back to pay paragraph 12, uh, the third contention, the, that, the, the deduction contention is the second one. That's not the third and the fourth. So my reading of this case is that the three and four go together because what what what, what the appellant was arguing, what the appellant was arguing is he was saying number one these costs were necessarily incurred and therefore they don't therefore they're not an emolument and they were covered in the settlement agreement that they are the three limbs to the appellant's argument not dealing with deductions because deduction is the second contention now I accept that the necessarily incurred that actually goes to both of the questions. Because if you're arguing that it's deductible, you'll say, well, it's necessarily incurred. But that doesn't get well, you Well, that's a gloss you put on it. You don't find that, actually, in the reasoning of the judge at all. Well, he says... Uh, he, he talks... He says two contentions were raised on... Uh, this is yeah. on page 80... On 88. He says two, two contentions were raised on behalf of Sir Albert, the third and the fourth. And then later on, he says, I'm prepared to accept the test which Mr Simons puts to me. Remind me, is Ricketts and Cahoon a deductions case? Yes. Mm. So then That's saying, then, cited in the same paragraph. Yes. Yes, so they're it, well, it, 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 in the paragraph beginning taking. So he's, it, my submission on this is he's saying it's not deductible. Then you need to look to see whether it's, it was a, a profit from the employment. He accepts that it was necessarily incurred um, in order to obtain payment because on page 89 he says... Um, I, accept the sub I accept the test which Mr Simons put to me. That's contentions three and four. But if it was necessary to obtain the payment, why was it not deducted from the payment? If because it wasn't... In it was necessary to obtain exactly. the payment. So if you're right, it should have been deducted, and uh, it wasn't. No, well, uh, what I'm saying, my lord, is, is there, are two, there, there are two requirements. One is that it's necessary... It's, 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 necessarily incurred in order to obtain the, the payment. Right, well, let's assume and, that in your favour on the facts of Eagle. Yes, and then secondly, on, this, is, this is what Finlay J decides, is he says the settlement agreement has to represent, uh, 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 has to represent those costs. That, and on the facts of Levy, Finlay said, well, that's why I'm deciding it's not a monument, because the settlement agreement doesn't... It, it costs are meticulously excluded from the settlement agreement. So fin Finney is Finney is with us, it, w with me, my lord, and, and with the upper tribunal on the application of the legal principles. He just then says, "Well, on the facts, I, I'm, I, it, 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 on the facts, it wasn't a monument because it was excluded from the settlement agreement." Right. So, so in other words, it's not good enough to say that costs may be deducted if they're necessarily connected with the receipt of the payment. You have to add, and the payment specifically refers to the costs. Yes, my lord. Yes. And, and that latter point hasn't been emphasised because I don't think it's in question here. Because but, and why should it be so? You say you're taxable if at all because it's a profit. When you calculate the profit, you look for net profit. That means you look at what you've got in and you take off the expenses you've incurred in getting it. Here we know that Sir Albert had incurred all these expenses. So... Why isn't that the end of it? Oh, 
My Lord, what I'm doing is I'm relying on this case, uh, and this case said that in addition there is this requirement. The fact that there's that requirement doesn't hurt my case, because in my case it's clear that the settlement agreement does cover Yes, but you've got to add a little bit of sense with respect as to why the requirement exists on your analysis. What has that requirement got to do with whether something's an emolument or not? Uh, Mali, I, I, would, I, I don't think my case turns on whether that is, that, that is a proper requirement or not. What well, the upper no, no, but please just focus on... We, we've got to see whether, as a matter of analysis, your reading of Mr Justice Finlay's judgment is correct. You say he's, he's saying that the, the question of emolument turns on whether it's actually specifically referred to in the settlement agreement or not. Uh, I can't say that's how I read it, but that's how you say we should read it. Um, and I just wonder on what legal basis the question of whether it's an emolument turns on what's said about it in the settlement agreement. Well, on, on, my submission would be to would be that it, 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 it's my submission would be that that's not a requirement. It, it, that, you don't. You, I don't. Ha, I don't have to rely on that. I don't. Sorry. I, I, my submission would be to, re, to to rely on what Lord Denning says in Hostrasser, which is just you have to show that it's in connection with the. Fine. Right, it is. If it is a requirement, what's the jurisprudential basis for it? That, that Eagles and Levy. That's the decision in Eagles and Levy. Well, you say to you that this decision is wrong, as I understand it, because. I don't well, need to say that. that well, you may not say, need to, but you, you do say it's wrong because Mr Justice Finley, on your case, should have said, look, um, these were expenses incurred in getting the money in, therefore you net off the cost. Um, as an alternative submission, my lord, yes. So the decision is wrong on your case? I... I, I I, I'm not sure that it, it, it matters to my case because in our case the settlement agreement did refer to the, the success fee so I, I don't have to say that Levy is wrong in order to be successful in my case If the, if the settlement agreement had not referred to the success fee Then I would have to argue that the Eagles and Levy was wrong Yes, my Lord. So it's because part of the 4.2 million was to be spent in paying the success fee and the premium that enables you to deduct those payments from the 4.2 million to arrive at the profit. Well, I, 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 my submission is that when you're asking what the profit is, it's clear um, that you take account of the... When you're asking what the profit is from the settlement payment, yeah. it's clear that you take into account the legal costs of, of, of suing the employer. I'm saying that that's clear. Um, if... if if the, if the agreement didn't refer to the success fee in the way that you've just described, HMRC would no doubt be coming here and, and showing Eagles and Levy saying, well, this is authority and it means that it's not deductible. Um, I, I, I'm, all I'm relying on Eagles and Levy for is to show that that's consistent with the approach of Lord Denning and consistent with the approach of the court, or of Coop and Owen, which is that profit means a net amount. Well, I have to say, I can't see how the result in Eagles is consistent with that proposition. But let me come back to the question you were asked before lunch by my lord. Um, here, we see that um, you get a certain sum in respect to agreed costs. Those are to be assessed, and inevitably there will be a shortfall between agreed costs and actual costs. All the actual costs will have been incurred in getting in the 4.2 million. Um, on your case, it has to be right, doesn't it? That you deduct all of the costs and not merely the assessed costs because they're all incurred in getting in the 4.2 million. Yes, my lord. So um, we do include all the costs that are incurred in getting in the 4.2 million. Now suppose that Mr Murphy um, had made various visits to the solicitors and incurred some travel costs doing that. He's incurred those travel costs in getting in the 4.2 million. Do you deduct those? Um, I, I, we wouldn't deduct those it, 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 because you know, they would be they would be treated as the uh, travel costs in in, in 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 the reimbursement cases. That would be travel from home. So I don't. But why has that got anything to do with it? We're concerned with the meaning of profit. Profit means net profit. 
That means you compare what you, the money you've got in with the expenses you've incurred in getting that money. His incurred expenses in going to the solicitor's office. So why isn't that deductible? Um, my, 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 I, 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 I can see that it, it would be deductible if, 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 if yes, my Lord, I can see that it would be deductible. And so any any expense that has been incurred uh, in getting in a receipt is to be deducted. Our submission would be that that follows from the from the loading profit in in section sixty two. And so necessarily has nothing to do with it. But uh, well. I, I, I went down this. I went down this line because I was explaining the decision of the upper tribunal, uh, which was by reference to the decision in Eagles and Levy, because of the similar fact pattern of those two cases. But does necessarily have any part to play in this, or is it just a calculation? What did you spend and what did you get? It, uh, Yes, as long as long as it was in, as long as the incurring of the expense was for the was in consequence of the or of getting the payment, but it, you obviously you couldn't include a personal expense. Right. So it wouldn't matter if Mr. Murphy went to the solicitors by taxi rather than bus. It's his choice to go by taxi. Well, in, in, in the same way, my lord, if if, if somebody's deducting expenses for their uh, if they're deducting expenses for, for travelling for work purposes, it doesn't matter if you. That go by first class or standard class. That it's still it's your it's it's still an expense. Yes. Just refer to, to uh, I think that the point's been raised about the fact that this was a damages based agreement and that that somehow affects the analysis. But uh, it, it, let's say that some of the claimants entered into a uh, some of the claimants entered into a conditional fee arrangement, and let's say that some of the other claimants just paid the agreed just paid their lawyers' fees in the same way. On your case, it wouldn't matter. On our case, it wouldn't matter. You, you, you would look at each of those cases and you would say, what was the profit they obtained from the employment? Uh, so what was the profit that they obtained as a result of the uh, settlement payment? So notwithstanding that if they had been paid all that money uh, at the time when it should have been paid as their earnings or part of their remuneration for their, for their employment, um, it would be taxed in whole. The fact that in order to get it, they've expended money on lawyers means that they don't have to pay tax on all this. Well, what it really boils well, down to. Well, my lady, with, with respect, I think that's a flawed analogy because if they had been if they had been paid all of the money under their employment contract, they wouldn't have had to infer, incur the legal fees. So they would have had the whatever they were paid would have been their profit. You can't and that you can't draw an analogy from that situation and say, well. In a different situation where they've had to incur legal fees of two million pounds, in this situation they still have to pay money on everything that they've got. The, the difference between those two situations, I, I would argue, those two situations aren't analogous because in the first you haven't had to incur a million pounds worth of lawyers' fees, whereas in the second you have had to incur a million yeah. pounds worth of lawyers' fees. And if you are applying section sixty-two, what's the profit? Then the profit in the second case is going to be net of those lawyers' fees. Well, that presupposes that you're right as to the meaning of profit. It, 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 it does, my lady. Sh sh shall I take you th th through the authority? That, uh, yes, I, do. I know, they, I know HMRC has been through them, but yeah. I, I think, to make this point, I think I'm going to have to go through them again. So right. if we could start with... I think with we probably finished with eagles, haven't we? Pardon? I think we probably finished with eagles. I, I think we finished with the eagles. Model. Right, so we go to Hofstrasser? If we go to Hofstrasser. submissions on Hostrasser 
are that this is a case where the payment to the employee was both not from the employment and also it didn't give rise to a profit. And to that extent, we say it's the same as, uh, as Mr. Murphy's case, because that's what the, first, that's what the upper tribunal, um, uh, we can go to this later on, but on our submission, that's what the upper tribunal said as well. They said, well, there's not actually any difference between the agreed cost and the success fee, or, or that, they, that they, began their, they began their analysis by reference to the agreed costs. They said the agreed costs aren't from the employment, they're from the litigation. Mm -hmm. And then they said, well, uh, the success fee is no different. But if you answer the first part of the question, which is whether it's from the employment or not, uh, in the negative, and say it wasn't from the employment, you don't even get into the question of asking whether it was a profit or not, because it's not taxable. Yes, my lady. And likewise, if you so reach the conclusion any, that... Anything said about... Um, I, don't, I don't see why your second limb is relevant. Because the, the statutory test is a profit from the employment. And the, as you say, my lady, if you say it's not from the employment, then it's not taxable. But likewise, if you say it's not a profit, it's not taxable. But what, what happened in Hostrass was just the, uh, and I accept uh, that the other, that the members of the House of Lords, other than Lord Denning, they, uh, they decided the case on the basis of, of the from question. Uh, but my submission is also that when you look at Lord Denning's, uh, uh, when you look at Lord Denning's decision, he agrees that it's not from, but he also discusses the question of whether it gives rise to a profit in, in, in any event, and his conclusion is that it doesn't. So that, 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 that it's quite a short passage. Could I, could I ask you to turn it up at page one, uh, uh, 112? So Lord Denning starts by saying, my Lord's Tried by the touchstone of common sense, which is perhaps a rather rash test to take in a revenue matter, I regard this as a plain case. No one coming to it uh, untrammeled uh, by the cases could regard the £350 as a profit from the employment. Mr Mace did not make a profit on the resale of the house he made a loss, and even if he had made a profit, it would not have been taxable. How then can his loss be taxable simply because he was indemnified against it? I can readily appreciate the case which was put in argument, namely that if an employer by way of a reward for services agrees to indemnify his employee against the losses on the stock exchange, um, the payments uh, which the employer received under the indemnity would be taxable, i.e. they would be both from the employment and they would give rise to a profit. But that would be because the losses were his own affair and nothing to do with his employment. The payments of indemnity, uh, the, the payments of indemnity would there be a straight reward services. This payment of £350 was nothing of that kind. It was a loss which Mr Mays incurred in consequence of his employment, and his employers indemnified him against it. I cannot see that he gets any profit therefrom. Now, my lords, our submission here is that when he's saying profit therefrom, he means profit from the payment. What he's actually talking about is a benefit, isn't he? I mean, if you look at the whole context of this... Um, what Lord Denning is saying is that the losses on the stock exchange were his own affair and nothing to do with his employment. So he's applying the uh, um, from test to that. The losses are his own affair and nothing to do with his, prop his employment. The indemnity that in that case would be a straight reward for services, so from the employment. This payment was not a straight reward for services. It was a loss he incurred. He was indemnified. It doesn't give him any profit. Yes, that's true. He's in in the sense of, um, uh, but he's using it in the sense of benefit, isn't he? A benefit. He's not getting a benefit as an emolument of his services, a reward for his services. It's also not clear to me what "there from" refers to. Mm. Might refer to "there from his employment." Yes. Well, that's how I read it. Yeah. My, my reading of the therefrom is that it's talking about that it's talking about the payment. So this payment of three hundred and fifty pounds was nothing of that kind. It was a loss which Mr. Mays incurred in consequence of his employment, and his employers indemnified him against it. I cannot see that he gets any profit therefrom. Uh, 
then in the next paragraph he says, um, why then in this case, uh, why then if this case is as plain as I think it is, has it got so far as to reach your lordship's house? Only I suggest because of the broad proposition which the Crown advanced about profits. Now if we look to see what that, um, what that argument was, that was on page 96. And it's at the it's at the bottom half of the page, it's the paragraph beginning every time. So the appellant's submission was that every time money, every time money is worth or a sum of money is received by an employee as such, that is a profit of his employment, except only in as far as the receipt is in return for full consideration in money or money's worth, other than his services under the employment. Which is essentially, I think, what HMRC is saying in this case, that when you read profit in section 62, you're, you're you're construing it as any payment received by the employee. No, uh, no, with respect, no. Uh, HMRC's case is that it's not just any old payment that the employer makes to the employee. It's a payment in connection with his services as an employee. Yes, my lady, that, 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 that's, not, that's not disputed. Yeah, and here, the settlement sum, the principal settlement sum, was paid for your client's services. It's the pay he should have got, but didn't. Well, my, my lord, the, the Met didn't accept any liability in this case. No, that, that was any of, the, that that any of these payments were, were due. So, w what the settlement agreement is is it's a mm. payment by the Met in, in full and in full and final satisfaction of the claim. Mm. And it's not not just the principal. It's, it's not just the uh, principal settlement sum which is paid in that way. The agreed costs are paid in that way. Yeah. That's paragraph three. There, there, there's, there's no distinction between the agreed costs and, uh, and the principal settlement sum in that respect. So, my lord, in our submission, it's not, it's not correct to say this was essentially just unpaid, uh, unpaid earnings and allowances. This wasn't. This was a payment in return for a settlement of a claim. Well, that's true, but if we look to see what the claim was which we've got in the supplemental bundle at page 16. It was a claim for payment of overtime work, payment for a away from home allowance, payment for hardship allowance, interest, and a declaration. Yes, my lord. So that's the claim. Yes. Of, of course, there are cost consequences attached to claims, but the claim itself was what was claimed in the claim form. Yes, my lord. Well, we are, I'm, I'm not for one second saying that the... That the um, all of what the, the claimants received was not earning, uh, was not from the employment. We accept that, yeah. that, uh, uh, that, uh, 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 that everything but the success fee and the agreed cost was from the employment. Uh, HMRC's case, uh, or, or, or my submission, HMRC's case doesn't make any sensible distinct, distinction between the agreed cost and the success fee, because both the agreed cost and the success fee were paid in return for settlement of the claim. Which my lord shows on HMRC's case that just because something is paid in settlement of the claim doesn't make it from the employment, because on their own case they can see that the agreed costs aren't from the employment, even though they're paid in return for settlement of the claim. Well, I can see the argument that you say that a success fee, if it's deline delineated as part of the settlement and it's and you're paying that, the success fee and uh, insurance uplift or what are not payments derived from the employment as such. But that's a different argument from the one that you're putting forward, which is that you, in order to work out what is a profit of the employment, you have to start netting off the expenses. My lady, we're making both of those submissions. So on, on the, the first submission is that there's no difference between the success fee and the agreed cost in this case. They are both, the, they're not from the employment, they are from the litigation, because they, uh, they, they, they that they they reimburse the uh, they reimburse the claimants for the costs of the litigation, and then the second submission which we make is that in any event there is no profit here because section sixty two says profit, and when you look to see whether there's a profit, you take into account any expenditure that was incurred in order to get. The 
So there's two aspects of that. Of, of that. There's two submissions. And that, my lord, they were exactly the same submissions that were made before the upper tribunal. The upper tribunal refers in its judgment um, to the submissions that were made. It seems to have decided the case on the basis of your of the profit analysis rather than the first point. Well, my lord, I, my lady, I, I think it does. I, I think the upper tribunal does both because it does say uh, the agreed costs aren't from the employment, and then it says there's no difference between the agreed costs and the success fee. Where does it say that? So the analysis of the agreed cost starts in paragraph 77. Yes. Right. It says the global settlement sum is not earnings from an employment to the extent that it comp compensates the agreed costs. Yes, my lady. And then it's uh, paragraph 79. It says, in our view, the same analysis can be used in respect of the other uh, costs incurred by the claimant. You see, that's a reference back to 1777. Yes, my lady. Now, now, that's right. In that respect, they are plainly differing from Judge Brennan. I'm sorry, Mum. If your reading of the upper tribunal is right, then in that respect, they are plainly disagreeing with Judge Brennan because he said it wasn't from. He said it was from. Y yes, my lord. And does that, going back to Eagles, um, would, the, would the right question then have been? Was uh, the first tier entitled to conclude that the payment was from employment? My, my lord, sorry, in Eagles was the. Uh, Eagles seems to have used a, a Bairstow, Edwards and Bairstow type test. Is that the test the upper tribunal should have applied on the from issue in this case? No, my lord, I would say that the form issue is a legal question. Right. My lady, if I can, just following up on, on the point, if I can refer to paragraph 83 as well, which is where the, the upper tribunal says, in, in the present case, there is no reason to distinguish between the various categories of costs. Each of the agreed costs, the success fee and the insurance premium, were necessarily incurred by the claimants in obtaining the global settlement sum. Well, that goes to necessity rather than from. But I suppose you might say, well, it's implicit. Well, he, I, I think what the upper tribunal is saying there is just there's no difference between these costs. They're, they're, all, they're all costs which the claimants have to incur in order to sue the Met. But in 84, they do differentiate between the agreed costs and the remainder on the basis of from in relation to the agreed costs and profit in relation to the success fee and insurance premium. So my, my Lord, you're referring to 84? Yeah. Paragraph 83 is deal, seems, on one view at any rate, to deal with whether these amounts were necessarily incurred in obtaining the global settlement sum. But then 84 seems to distinguish between the agreed costs, which are not from the employment, and the remainder goes to the question of profit. But I may be misreading. Well, you would have expected, perhaps, that if, if your reading is consistent, that there would have been a sentence in there afterwards saying, uh, as far as we are concerned, as regards the remainder of the sum, um, neither was the um, uplift or the, the success fee and the insurance premium. But even if we're wrong about that, um, it's, not, it's not a profit. Mm. And that's when you go down to 88, where they remake the decision. They don't say in the remade decision that the success fee um, and the insurance premium weren't from the employment. They say Mr. Murphy didn't make a profit. And that's the only reason they give for the remade decision. Mm. 
it, it, it's clear that, 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 that it was mainly on the profit issue which they decided their case. But our, our submission, our submission is, is that it was also part that they also took the view in the decision that there was no difference between these, the, the agreed costs and the success fee. Yeah. Well, and I, think we've, I think we've got your submission on that and we can read it for ourselves and um, arrive at an understanding of what it means. So, we're we going to go back through the cases now. You wanted to show us the cases? Uh, yeah, yes, just if you could give me just a moment, my lord. which, uh, mm -hmm. as, uh, as we've seen, there is this complication of Ostrasser because there are these two issues. One, is it from the employment? The other one, is it a profit or not? And, and uh, So the, the next question would be, can we think of a case where um, it's, not a, it, it's not in a question whether it's from the employment or not, so a case where the payment is clearly from the employment, and in that, uh, uh, but, uh, but a case where, they, uh, where the... Uh, where the court applies the form, so it applies the profit question, the, the profit test. And in my submission, Pook and Owen is that case, because it's accepted in Pook and Owen that the reimbursement is from the employment. But in my submission, what the, what the House of Lords decides in Pook and Owen Is that it didn't give rise to a profit? Yeah. That's where we're going next, is it? That's where we're going next. Right. So, if I could start on page one seven three, which is the uh, decision of Lord Guest, at the top of the page at A, you'll see that I've got. I'm going to refer to the, the passages I refer to are going to have markings by the side of them. So, Lord Guest starts by setting out the two questions that arise. This is at the top between A and B, page one seven three. Two questions arise. One, whether the travelling allowances were properly included in the appellant's emoluments for income tax purposes under Schedule 2. And two, whether the actual cost of the journeys was deductible from his emoluments under the relevant code. So there's the emoluments question, and then there's the deductible question. Then there's, uh, then there's his decision, which is at the bottom of paragraph 174. Um, it's, it's been referred to a bit short, so I'll, I'll just read it quickly. Um, at, at the bottom, he says, the facts in this case were wide, widely different from the present, thus referring to Hostrasser. And then he goes on, he says, but if the proper test is whether the sum is a reward for services, and my lords, I, I agree with HMRC that when he says if there, I think he is accepting that that is the proper test. Um, he, he says that if the proper test is whether the sum is a reward for services, then in my view, the travelling allowances paid to Dr. Owen were not emoluments. To say that Dr. Owen is to that extent better off, now my laws, I think he, what he means here is better off by virtue of the reimbursement. So he says to say that Mr. Owen is to that extent better off is not the point. The allowances were used to fill a hole in his emoluments by, uh, by his expenditure on travel. The allowances were made for the convenience of the employee to allow him to do his work at the hospital from a suitably adjacent area. In my view, the travelling allowances were not emoluments. And while all there, he has to mean that they, they didn't give rise to a profit, because there's no question that the emoluments weren't from the employment. There's no question that the reimbursement payments weren't from the employment. So this has to be a finding that they this has to be a finding that they didn't give rise to a profit. If I'm right that the allowances are not emoluments. No question arises as to deductibility of the actual of the actual travel sums expended on the twenty mile journey. So, my lords, our submission is that this is an example. As, as, this is an example of the courts, when applying profit, looking for a, looking for an overall profit, a, a net figure. They're not treating profit simply as any payment from the employer. Go over the page now to uh, 176. This is the uh, decision of Lord Pierce. 
Um, I, I'm going to read just, this is an F to G. Well, um, you, you're absolutely right that the House of Lords are not treating any payment from the employer as a profit, because the test, as you accept, I think, is whether it's a reward for services. So it's obviously not any, any payment from the employer. It's got to be a payment as a reward for services. Yes, my lord, it's got to be from the employment, yeah. yes. But my, my submission is that once you establish the payments from the employment, that isn't the end of the that isn't the end of the investigation. You then have to work. You then have to ask the second question. When you're dealing with section sixty two two b, you then have to ask the second question, which well, is does the payment give rise to a profit? You are, you, yes, but what Lord Guest says, let, let, let's change the if. So the proper test is whether the sum is a reward for services. In my view, the travelling allowances paid to Doctor Owen are not emoluments. That is to say. They are not a sum paid in reward for services. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on to say, to say that he's better off, i.e. he's got money in his pocket that he wouldn't otherwise have, is not to the point. Um, they were made for to enable him to do his work at the hospital. That's part of the rationale as to why they're not a reward for his services. He's not being rewarded for his services. He's being given the money in order to enable him to do his job. Isn't that isn't that the way of looking at it? He's, it's not it's not a profit and loss analysis at all in the meaningful sense of the word. Oh, well, my lady, our submissions is that his, his reference to filling a hole by the, his reference to filling a hole in. Uh, in his emoluments by the expenditure of travel, and um, that is indicating that what he's looking for is a is a is a net profit. He's saying, "Are oh, you better off as a result of this payment?" If I could now turn to this is Lord Pierce's uh, decision, so I'm, I'm going to refer to page 178 at the top. Can, can just before we go, just, can we just look at the, the argument of the taxpayer, which was um, Mr. Monroe presented? If we go to page 167, just below D. He says, On the question whether the travelling expenses paid to Dr. Owen were taxable as emoluments at all, Either they were not profits or emoluments because they were not paid to him for the services for which he was engaged, which were medical services, not driving between two hospitals. Or if that's wrong, then they're expenses. So what he, the reason that they're not profits is they weren't being paid for medical services. They were being paid for driving between the hospitals, or his GP practice in the hospital. Uh, that's the so that's the sort of the argument which the Lords accepted. Y y y yes, my lord. Yeah. And that's why Lord Guest says that if the sum is a reward for services, then the travelling allowances paid to Doctor Owen are not emoluments, because he wasn't providing the service of driving. But my lord, if if the employer paid uh, paid the sums of uh, uh, if the payer, if the employee reimbursed the sums of the employee getting them home to work, that would be that payment would be from the employment. Certainly. And then the question would have to be, uh, uh, and yes, my lord. And then the, the question there is whether it gives rise to a profit or not. Well, if he's, <laughs> if you're right, then. If the employee um, buys the rail ticket in advance uh, in order to get to his job and the employer reimburses him that money, he'd be making no profit. Uh, he, ne he needs to outlay the expenditure and therefore it wouldn't be taxable. 
No, my lady, because it, th this is what Lord Denning refers to in, in Hostrasse. He says there's a distinction between a loss which is incurred in consequence of the employment uh, and a loss that's included and a, a loss that's incurred for personal purposes. So travelling from home to work would be a personal uh, purpose, and so that wouldn't. So the, a reimbursement of that expense um, uh, would be an emolument. That, 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 that's what Donald, that, that, that's what uh, Lord Justice Walton says in the Donnelly case. Yeah. Yeah, if, I, if I may quickly go to the top of 178, it says there was a further point raised by the appellant in the Court of Appeal. He contends that the reimbursements such as that which is here in question do not come within the emoluments of the employment under Schedule E. They therefore uh, never fall to be charged and it is unnecessary to consider whether they are allowable under Rule 7, namely the deductions. In my opinion that contention is correct. Emoluments are charged. These are defined as including all salaries, fees, wages, perquisites and profits whatsoever. The reimbursement of actual expenses are clearly not intended by salary, fees, wages or profits. And then he says it is contended they are perquisites. The normal meaning of the word denotes something that benefits a man by going into his own pocket. It would be a wholly misleading description of an, of an office to say that it, that it had very large perquisites merely because the holder had to disperse very large sums out of his own pocket, pocket and subsequently received a reimbursement or partial reimbursement of those sums. He then gives an example. If a school teacher takes children out for a school treat, paying them out of his own, out of his or her own pocket and is later wholly or partially reimbursed by the school, nobody would describe him or her as enjoying a perquisite. In my view, perquisite has a known meaning, um, namely a personal advantage which would not apply for a mere reimbursement of necessary disbursement. There is nothing in this section to give a different meaning. Indeed, the other words of the section confirm the view that some element of personal profit is intended. Well, Lord, our submission on that is again. This is this is Lord, this is Lord Pierce looking to see whether there has been a look, looking to see whether there has been a, a net profit as a result of the payment of the reimbursement. Page one seven nine. This is the decision of Lord Donovan. Um, I'm just going to read it. At B. He sets out the what is now section sixty two. Tax under Schedule E is charged on the full amount of the emoluments from the office or employment, and emoluments are defined as including all salaries, fees, wages, perquisites, and profits whatsoever. He then says this definition certainly gives no impetus towards the view that it covers sums paid to an employee simply in reimbursement of expenses incurred in carrying out his duties nor do the dictionary definitions of the word, namely profit or gain, advantage, due, advantage, due reward, remuneration, salary, nor does section one of the act which contemplates income tax will be imposed on profits or gains. What, what is? What is a dictionary definition? Dictionary definition of the word. Which word? Perquisites, is it? Sorry, my lord. He says tax under Schedule E is charged on the full amount of the. Oh, is it emoluments, perhaps? Is it? Is he, he talks about the dictionary definitions of the word, singular. I think he must, I think he whereas he just referred to salaries, fees, wages, perquisites, and profits. So is it emoluments? I think it is from the previous paragraph. Yeah. Emoluments are defined as including, and then all salaries, etc., right. etc. So this definition certainly gives no interest. That's the definition of emolument. 
Pearson's decision, which is on page 184. His decision is at H at the bottom of the page. The other question in the appeal is whether the travelling allowance which the appellant receives from hospital authorities constitutes an emolument from his employment. I would arrive at the answer in this way. Suppose that A, B, and C are employed each at a salary of £500 per annum, and in the first year each has to pay entirely out of his own pocket the expenses of travelling between his home and his place of work. Then in the second year the employer reimburses to A the cost of his season ticket or gives him allowance of, say, £8 per mile for coming to work and returning home by car. A is better off financially by the amount of the reimbursement or allowance. He is better off than he himself was in the first year and better off than B and C, who still have to pay entirely out of their own pocket the expenses of travelling between their homes and their places of work. As A has effectively a better income than B or C, he ought to pay more income tax than they do. The reimbursement or car allowance is a benefit to A as a sum of money. In my opinion, it is a perquisite of profit and emolument. And then he says there is a quite different position where the employee incurs an expense in performing the duties of his employment. For example, making a journey from his head office to branch office and back to head office or buying stamps and stationery for the firm and it is reimbursed him. In such a transaction there is no benefit, no profit or gain to the employee. He does not receive any emolument. Why does he think that's unfair? He's referring to the reimbursement of a personal expense, which he defines as travelling from home to work. He's saying it would be unfair if the reimbursement of that expense were not treated as emolument because the reimbursement of that expense makes the employee better off. So our submissions on this are again that he's at C, he's looking for the net amount. He's looking to see whether there's a profit or a gain to the employee as a result of receiving the reimbursement. And then if I could ask you to turn to Taylor and Proven. Now, this is a case which wasn't referred to by me because in our submissions Taylor and Proven isn't relevant at all because in Pook and Owen, the question was, was the reimbursement an emolument? Pook and Owen concerned a doctor, not a director, so the benefits code didn't apply. Likewise, in the Donnelly case, which I'm going to look at in a moment, it was concerned a teacher, again, not in a higher earning employment, so again, the benefits code didn't apply in Donnelly. Whereas in Taylor and Proven, we're dealing with a director, so the benefits code applied. So in this case, the court isn't considering the application of the word profit. No, it's just considering deduction. It's just considering whether it's a deduction. So really, the decision in Taylor and Proven has no relevance for what we're discussing. That's why HMRC's submission that Donnelly should be regarded as per incurium because Taylor and Proven wasn't referred to in Donnelly. But that's obviously wrong because the issues in Taylor and Proven were just different from the issues in Donnelly because Taylor and Proven is about deduction and Taylor and Proven is about the benefits code. Well, it wouldn't really matter, would it, whether Donnelly was or wasn't per incurium. It doesn't bind us, and if we disagree with it, we can say so. Yes, my lord, that's right. 
the only reason I'm referring you to uh, Taylor and Coburn is, 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 is the decision, is, is the, the comments of Lord Simon at uh, page 210. Yeah. So it's, it's, the, it's the second paragraph where he says at one, he says, apart from section 160 of the Income Tax Act 1952, that's the Benefits Code, mm -hmm. the predecessor of the Benefits Code, he says, I should have thought that, in principle, the answer to the first question depends on the answer to the second. Um, so that's saying he's, the, an the, the answer to the question of whether it's an emolument depends on whether or not it's deductible. He says, if the expense in respect of which the reimbursement is made is not deductible, its reimbursement to the taxpayer would, in my view, be an emolument, making him so much better off than another employee or office holder who has to bear an expense out of his own pocket. That's against you, though, isn't it? Mm. It's common ground that the legal costs are not deductible uh, in this case. Y yes, as I understand it. So uh, their yes. reimbursement to Mr. Murphy is does make him better off than any other employee. What Lord Simon is saying is that if you can deduct it, then there's no there's no benefit to you because the receipt is matched by the deduction. But if you can't deduct it, then the receipt is a benefit to you. But that's that's against you on the it, facts of this case, isn't it? It is, my lord. And then Lord Simon goes on, just uh, just reading on from from where we've just stopped. He says, "But in Pook and Owing, the majority of your lordship's house held uh, the majority of your lordship's uh, house held otherwise." Yes, in other words, they're separate questions. No, he's saying that in... What he's saying here is he's saying that um, in Pook and Owen, whether the, reimburse, whether the reimbursement was an emolument didn't depend on it being deductible or not. No, it was, as I say, they're two separate questions. One, is it an emolument? Two, if it is, is, the, is, a, is a, uh, an expense deductible? Yes, my lord, but in answering that first question, so the first question is, 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 is a reimbursement an emolument? Mm-hmm. Um, what Lord Simon's saying is he's saying a reimbursement um, is uh, it, it's it's not an it, 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 what he's saying here is he's saying um, it, it's not an emolument uh, it, it is an emolument um, if the payment's not it but it's not an emolument if the payment's deductible that's what Lord Simon's is saying in his view the law should be yes yes but he's just saying that that wasn't the decision in Pooh yeah. and Owen he's saying that in Pooh and Owen the question of whether or not a reimbursement was an emolument or not didn't depend on whether it was deductible or not. It depended on whether it whether it was a uh, whether it was uh, whether it was in incurred in consequence of the employment or whether it was personal. And in Pook and Owen, it was regarded as personal because it was the cost of travelling between the home and the workplace. So that's the reason why it wasn't deductible. But that's the reason why it wasn't an emolument. It doesn't depend on the deductibility question. No. I say this, my lord, because there's a HMRC skeleton uh, 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 that includes submissions where they say that um, in deciding whether it's an emolument, um, it's only expenses that are deductible that aren't treated as that, that are deductible that are not emoluments. Whereas I'm saying that this is authority for the, the Lord Simons is saying, in his view, that should be the the, yeah, the, the, but the position, not. but it's not. Right. <coughs> If I can just spend a, a, a little longer on, on, on why uh, Lord Simon doesn't like the uh, decision in, in Pook and Owen, um, it, it seems that, that it, it comes down to the starting point. Lord Simon uh, appears to be taking um, two employees who have both incurred an expense, and then he's asking, does the, does the reimbursement make one of them, uh, and, sorry, two employees that have both incurred an expense, one of them receives a reimbursement. Lord Simons in that paragraph is saying, does that reimbursement make that employee better off? And he's saying yes. Whereas, it, whereas it, it, the approach in, in, in Pook and Owen is to, start, is to have a different starting point. The starting point in Pook and Owen is you, you have one employee who hasn't incurred the expense, 
another employee that has incurred the expense and received the reimbursement, and you ask, is the employee who's incurred the expense and the reimbursement, is that employee better off as a result? And in Poop and Owen, they say the answer is no. And so therefore, the reimbursement isn't, a, it isn't an emolument. My submission on, on Lord Simon's approach was that even if you have sympathy for Lord Simon's approach, even if you say, well, you can ignore the expense and just ask, does the reimbursement make the employee better off? That approach can have no application to our case, because in our case, it's not the, it's not the situation that, the, that uh, Mr. Murphy incurred a, a, a liability to pay the success fee, and then subsequently received a settlement payment. Those two events are one, because he only he was only it, there was only a liability to pay the success fee in the event that he received a settlement payment. Yeah. But I mean, do we need to look at maybe we don't need to look at Lord Simon's uh, explanation of what Pook and Owen did decide, which we get at page two two one of the report, page two one three of the bundle. Uh, he refers to Ricketts and Cahoon, and then he says between E and F, um, two different classes of travelling expenses. The first is where the office or employment is of itself inherently an itinerant one. Then just above G, the second class of case, is where the taxpayer has two places of work and is required by the nature of his office of employment to travel from one to the other. And then you go to the next page. Just below A, in my view, Dr. Owen in Poop was held to fall into this second category, and this was the ratio decidendi of the case. So that's his explanation of Poop and Owen. But he, he's, he's referring here to the deductibility question, because th th that's the only question that's of any interest to Lord Simon's, because in Lord Simon's case, it was deemed to be an emolument under the Benefits Code. So he, he's, not, he's, not refer he's not dealing with Poop and Owen on the point that, that, we're, de that we're using Poop and Owen for which is namely, was the, did the reimbursement give rise to an emolument or not? He's looking at Pook and Owen for the second question, which was, was the expense of travelling deductible or not? Right. The ratio of Pook and Owen is purely on the deductibility point. You can't pray it in aid on the profits point. Well, Manet, I, I, I would say that it's, it's the other way around, because if Pook and Owen says, uh, decides, as they did, if Pook and Owen decides that it's not a monument, then there is no second question of deduction. Logically, the prior... Lord question. Simon's wrong when he says what the ratio decide end by was. What I think Lord Simons means there is that the, the majority of the uh, House of Lords in Pook and Owen decided that it was deductible. Logically, if it's if logically that must be a uh, the second it must be uh, that question only follows in the event that you decide that it wasn't a monument, whereas it's the, the majority in Pook and Owen decided that it wasn't a monument. Well, I think you're entitled to say that in Pook and Owen, uh, Doctor Owen was entitled to deduct his actual cost of travelling over and above what he was reimbursed by the hospital. Because there was a bit extra, which yes, they Lord. did consider, mm -hmm. and they said, yes, he was entitled to deduct it. So to, yes, my Lord. So to that extent, there were there, there two elements in, in, in Pook and Owen, and there's, yes. So there's the, there's the ratio as to the, the bulk of it, and then there's the ratio yep. as to the... Now to the, the Donnelly case. This yes. is at um, 
page 221 of the authorities manual. Now, as, as uh, Mulder Lewis has said, this is, this is, these are open to comment by um, uh, Walter Jeff. But I, I'm going to ask you to look at page 230. These are the comments after B. This is after he um, summarizes the decisions in Puganori. And then at B he says, um, now as far as all these three approach uh, so, now as far as these approaches are all of one kind, and they can be summarized thus, that the repayment of expenses is not an emolument. Uh, and then he says this is the conclusion reached by Vine Lot J in the case of Perrins and, and Spackman. Uh, and appears to be unassailable. I may, however, add that with respect, I differ from the conclusion uh, that Lord Guest and Lord Pierce based their conclusion that the car allowance was not a monument on the ground that under the terms of the taxpayer's employment, he had two places of work. Now, I, would, I, I understand that as being, he, he's saying that it didn't depend on the deductibility question. Because if you had two places of work, then the cost of travelling between them would be deductible. Uh, Walton J goes on, there is no trace that I can find in either of the speeches to suggest that this aspect of the that, that on this aspect of the matter they relied on the two places of work point, and indeed Lord Lord Donovan expressly rejects it, although Lord Wilberforce, another member of the majority, made made it this the cornerstone of his controversy. So I think this is the same point as as Lord Simons was making in Taylor and Cobham that the, the ratio of proof and owing wasn't that the reimbursement wasn't uh, an emolument because it was deductible. Yes, I'm going to confuse myself, but um, he says cases can all be summarised as repayment ex of expenses is not an emolument. Um, but he's recognised back at page 227 that repayment of expenses of travelling to work is taxable. And we're not here in, within the scope of the special rules that applied in um, Taylor and Proven. Benefits Code. The Benefits Code. So, what's the distinction in Mr. Justice Walton's mind? Uh, the, the distinction in Mr. Justice Walton's mind is, is exactly the same as the distinction um, in, in Lord Denning's mind in Hostrasser. He's saying that if if you're being if you're being reimbursed for a personal expense, namely the cost of travelling from home to work, um, that isn't a monument. Whereas if you are being reimbursed for a uh, an expense that's in consequence of the employment. Um, perhaps not an emolument because when you look at profit, profit means a, a, a net amount, are you better off? So just trying to think it through, if the reimbursement were taxable, it would be as a profit? Or not? It, yes, well, if it's not covered by the benefits code, yes, my lord, it'd be taxable as a profit. Um, so why can't the employee say, well, in order to earn this money, I had to incur the commuting cost. It's an expense I incurred in um, achieving the gain. What? It's, so that should be netted off against my profit. Because uh, the Lord Denning in, in Ostras says well, it's only it's, if it's a personal expense, um, then you don't net that off. If it's, if it's a personal loss or a personal expense, then you don't net that off in determining what the profit is. But I'm just trying to understand how the case works. You say profit means net profit. You look at what's come in and you set against it costs incurred in getting that gain. Here, the allowance has come in. Um, that's a gain. And the other side of that equation is buying the season ticket. So why don't you net them off? You, you don't net them off because you only you only net off an expense which you've incurred in consequence of the employment. Well, it might be argued that you would because you wouldn't be able to earn the money unless you got to the place of work. Um, 
but, but likewise you only incurred that expense because you decided to live where you did. So if you look, at, if you look in, in, in this case, this is what Donnelly is saying in this case, he's saying, well, I, regard, I, I, I don't take that cost into account because that's, that's a personal cost. Is there any more in Donnelly? Uh, only, my lord, at the bottom of page 230, which is where Morton says the, the final line. Of course, this is only the second limb of the uh, taxpayer's defence. Um, but if it were to fail, then I think it obvious that even so, the only matter which could properly be called an emolument would be the benefit element in the allowance, the non-benefit element being properly protected by the undeniable principle of proof yeah. owing. So there he's saying, well, if you, if you receive the reimbursement and the reimbursement is more than the travel expense, <coughs> um, the excess uh, might need to be treated as an emolument, but as regards the, uh, as regards the amount of the expenses and travelling expenses, that, is a, that would be a problem. Yes. <coughs> well, what's the last? Last guess, like. Two would be um, the Reed case, but if I may, I'll start with the um, with the decision, um, the, the first tier decision. So this is a the case starts at two six two. Quite a distinguished first tier. Yeah. Yes, my lord. So I'd like to refer to paragraph to page three three three. salary sacrifice, it is, we think, clear from the authorities that whether the allowances fall within Chapter 1, that's uh, uh, Section 62, yeah. or Chapter 3, that's the Benefits Code, um, does depend as the first step in analysis on whether they represented a reimbursement, assuming they were to be, re assuming they were to be treated as reimbursements of, at all, of ordinary commuting expenses or of expenses incurred I I in the employed temp's employment. So this is this is like the the, the, the point, my lord, that uh, that you made earlier. They're saying here that if it's if it's the expenses of travelling from home to work, then a reimbursement in respect of that expense is an emolument under Chapter One under Section sixty two. But if it's an expense of travelling to one workplace and another, that's not an emolument. And then it, they go on. They say we agree with Mr. Gammy that. Um, if it was the former, what Walton J said in Donnelly and Williamson is determinative. They remained emoluments within section 62. And then he says here, he goes on to say, it is not the fact that the expense is not deductible, true though it is, which leads to this conclusion, um, but that the payment defrays what has to be regarded as a personal, brackets getting to work, rather than an emolument doing the work expense. Employment. Money. You said emolument, you meant employment. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, rather than, rather than employment. Given that the upper tribunal expressly approved this paragraph, what extra do we get out of it? Um, it, it, it's not my word. I'm just showing you that paragraph to then show you that oh, that's, that's the paragraph that was expressly approved yes, by indeed. the upper tribunal. Paragraph 274. Yes, my lord. So, so there, 
So what, what, what we take from these cases, my lord, is, is that the is that in these cases the the, the the tribunals are looking to see whether there is a they're looking to see whether there is a a, a profit to the employee, and they're looking to see whether you you can deduct the expenses, the travelling expenses, in determining whether the reimbursement gives rise to a profit. Whether the expense, whether or not the, ex, whether or not you can take into account the expense, doesn't depend on whether the expense is deductible. It depends on whether the expense is a personal expense. Or whether it's a work-related expense. And in these cases, they treated the cost of travelling from home to work as a personal expense. submissions on these cases are that the, the courts are looking for, they are looking for a net amount of profit. Yeah. Well, you might put it as a net gain rather than a profit. to the employee as a result of this payment? Yes, my lady, but the, the statutory question is profit. Yes. But you say that in order to work out what is meant by profit, profit equals net gain as opposed to uh, simply um, a, a form of remuneration. Y yes, my lady. But I'm saying that in, in these cases that we've looked at, uh, the courts are looking to see whether there's a net gain. If I could, if I could just, um, if I could refer to the, we've seen that, that Lord Denning referred to the common sense approach when he was discussing the stressor. If I can come to the common sense approach in this case, so we are in a situation here where uh, the claimants taken together receive four point two million pounds. There was the success fee, which was paid directly to the Met, to their lawyers. That was £1.2 million. So the amount which the, um, which the claimants received was £2.95 million. Our submission is that on any common sense view, that's the profit that they obtained from suing the Met. But that's not the question. The question is not what profit they obtained from suing the Met. The question is whether they uh, obtained a profit from their employment. Well, Malay, we would say that they... That they didn't obtain a profit from the employment. But <coughs> we, we, my lady, we would say the profit from the employment that they received was 2.95 2 million. That's what they received. 
Whereas HMRC's contention here is that they should be taxed as receiving a profit from the economy of 4.2 million. Hmm. Well, it can't depend upon whether the happenstance that it was paid directly wouldn't make any difference to your argument, surely, if the Met actually paid them the 4.2 um, million directly into their pocket and they immediately paid over the 1.2 million to their solicitors and, and uh, the insurers. No, my lady, and that, no. that's, that's exactly what happened with the agreed. Well, that's exactly what happened with the agreed costs. The yeah. agreed costs. Uh, uh, it, I mean, it can't, it, you, the, the question of whether or not it's a, a taxable receipt can't depend on the methodology of payment. No, my lady, I, I'm simply referring to the economic substance here. Yes. Which which we say is that they received um, 2.95 million. It, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's you say a, that's what their net gain was out of this. That's what their profit was out of this. Yes, my lady, and that's a, that, that it's it's a it's a it's a very unjust result if they are to be taxed on a on on having received um, earnings of 4.2 million, when the clear economic substance here is that they've received a, they, they've received a payment of 2.95. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Mr. Uh, Carey, do you wish to reply? My Lord, I just came to ask if Mr. Collins had any submissions on ground three before I stand up. Doesn't seem to. No. And, um, well, my Lord, the only thing we would say in reply is in respect to the final point about common sense, which is it doesn't matter which way you skin the cat. The payment that was made was unpaid earnings. Payment that was made with what? The, the payment that was made by the Met was unpaid earnings. The fact that it was then used to discharge liabilities of itself might be considered an advantage. But it doesn't, uh, in my submission, matter because it was the 4.2 million that was paid and then it was entirely up to the respondent and each of the officers to work out how that was distributed, and they, they chose to distribute it in the way they did. One can't complain, in my submission, that they have distributed the money in the way they saw fit. Well, is that really quite right? Because um, the settlement agreement obliged it to be distributed in a particular way, and that was um, that the 1.2 million was paid by um, the Met directly to uh, the solicitors and the um, insurers. My lady, in fact, it was the damages-based agreement which required it to be paid in the way it was. Right. The mechanism was then set out in the settlement agreement. Fair enough. So the damages-based agreement provided for the uh, lawyers effectively to be paid first, uh, and the settlement agreement uh, then set out the way in which that would occur. Right. And, and I can take you no, to that if, if that assists. Um, if I might just turn my back. Um, the only thing, uh, in, in addition, is it's 13.4 of the damages-based agreement on page 12. You agree that we may receive any sums that the Met is ordered to pay you. If the Met refuses to make payments to us and insists on paying you direct, you will pay any sums to uh, uh, any sums so received forthwith on their receipt into a bank account held in the joint names of you and us, which will account uh, which account will be made by, by us to you. Um, uh, unless I can assist further. Did you want to say anything uh, about the um, passing sort of Edwards and Bairstow point that was raised? Um, where at one point I think it was it was being argued, um, despite the difficulties of the remade decision, um, that it didn't satisfy that the payment didn't satisfy the from test. In my submission, there was no respondent's notice as the starting point. Yeah. Uh, 
So that submission is not open to my learned friend, if that's what he meant. To the extent that it is permitted and it was included in uh, the argument, uh, our submission remains the same about whether it was from the employment or not. And the, the answer is the same. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Very grateful, my lord. Um, there's plenty to think about. Thank <laughs> you very much for your arguments, which are very thought provoking. Uh, we will reserve our judgment. You will get a draft in the usual way. Um, that's your opportunity to correct our English, but not our reasoning. Uh, as you will know, the draft judgment now comes with a fierce embargo, which means exactly what it says. We would hope that in the light of the draft, you will be able to agree a form of order disposing of the appeal. But if you can't agree on a form of order, please make short written submissions, and we will make a form of order that we think is appropriate. Thank you both very much. Thank you.